Dalen here with another random making encounter. If you are returning to the channel, welcome back. It's always good to see familiar faces. If you're new, welcome. Today I'm going to be making another bookshelf diorama, another book nook. For this project, I'm going to be using one of these craft store, craft paper, craft boxes. It's going to be very crafty. I'm giving this a whirl because it can sometimes feel overwhelming to have to make a thing before you make the thing. I need to make the box before I can make what goes inside of the box. Using something like this off the shelf jumpstarts the project and lets me focus on the content, on the world building, and less on making the container. This also kind of reminds me of making those shoebox dioramas as a kid. I always chose to make a diorama instead of writing a report which probably explains a little bit of why I do what I do and why I really do not know how to use a semicolon. This project is also based on a subscriber request. You know who you are asking for an example of using fiber optics and LEDs to create a twinkling sparkling effect. So we'll use some fiber optics, NeoPixels and an Arduino to see if we can make that happen. Now, nothing sparkles like a big old treasure pile. So the theme of this nook is a Dungeons and Dragons fantasy treasure room. To quickly create the walls and floors, I'll also be using polymer clay and texture rollers. Throw in a little bit of 3D printing and miniature painting for good measure and we should be good to go. There's a lot crammed into this one, so let's get random. One of the nice things about working with these craft boxes is that they usually come in sets of multiple sizes, many sizes. So out of the box, I don't need to pick the size of my box out of the box. I'm going to use the next to largest size. And the only thing I really need to do to make this a usable nook is cut a hole in the lid for the window. I'm following the general process that I use, which is to create an interior box for the box. Here we go again on the boxes, but a shell that I can slide in and out. This allows me to work more easily in the space. It provides room for electronics, lighting, LEDs, doors, windows, all of that good stuff. These are really simple to make and you're not investing a lot in materials in case something goes horribly wrong. I'm just using a little miter box and a razor saw to cut the uh, balsa strips or the basswood strips and those are just six mil or quarter inch balsa or bass they could really be anything a little bit of glue and some of these cool little my favorite spring clamps to hold it all together and you are off to the races these can be banged together pretty quickly all of the interior textures are made using polymer clay in this case super sculpey the first part of this process is to condition the clay by rolling it through a sacrificial pasta maker. I say sacrificial because thou shalt never use your pasta maker that you've used for polymer clay for pasta ever again because of plastic. The texture roller that I'm using is one that I 3D printed. You can find texture rollers on Etsy. There's a lot of them on Etsy and you can find files to download for free on sites like My Mini Factory. In fact, I have some of my files posted there, the ones that you see me using. I am working on a glass cutting board that is tempered glass and heat resistant. This allows me to roll and texture the polymer clay directly onto the surface, trim everything up, and then transfer it directly into my toaster oven for baking. It avoids any sort of stretching or tearing or tweaking of the clay from texture to baked. Green Stuff World is another great source of texture rollers. It's not an endorsement. It's a hearty endorsement, but not a paid one. They create things for scale model making. So they are really nice textures and they work really well for scale terrain. Once everything's baked, they need a little bit of primer. So this is some Vallejo Black. Airbrush makes this go a lot faster. This just ensures that the paint will stick and it covers up that lovely flesh-colored polymer clay. 
I hit him with a bit of a Zenithal highlight with some lighter white uh, primer. This may or may not be necessary depending on how you paint. It's probably not really necessary for me because I tend to paint opaquely. But if you use speed paints or washes and glazes, this is a great way to get a lot of light and dark established. I do this for all of the things that are going inside of the nook, including this little door that I made with some polymer clay. This chest and all of the crates are from some scatter terrain that I found online. So really where I start a lot of times is finding the things that will be in the diorama before I make the diorama. The figures for this project are from Artisan Guild. Again, not paid. This just I just love the vibe of their sculptures. I tend to, it just really resonates with me, so I tend to use them a lot in my projects. Here's the wall panels with a little test fit in situ, and then once everything is primed, it's time for painting. Through the miracle of time travel, we can now see all of these nicely painted perhaps maybe too nicely painted. I find that I need to strike a better balance between the amount of time I put into painting and what will really be seen. I think it's important to have variety of color and contrast so that there is visual interest in the project, but I sometimes might spend too much time painting stuff that's just never going to be seen. Once the panels are all glued into the diorama, it's time to do a little bit of trim carpentry. This all serves the same purpose as what you would find trimming the room of a house. It hides all the seams. It provides uh, transitions and visual interest to the room. I'm using this little chopper and this little shooting board. If you do a lot of this kind of stuff, these are handy, but absolutely not needed. You can do this with a, a utility knife and some sandpaper. Another nice thing about this type of trimming out is it adds just that extra little bit of detail and it also provides some additional dimensionality that could cast some interesting shadows and provide some cool depth to the project. It's time to really start thinking about electronics at this point. It's usually better to start thinking about them out of the get-go, but I'm using some copper tape and some flicker LEDs. I really love these things because they provide a lot of variety in the quality of light for little to no effort. Each LED flickers independently, which gives you good variation in the lighting. This is battery powered. I wanted this to be very self-contained, so I'm gluing in enough battery holders that I'll wire in series to provide power for the circuit for the Arduino and the LED lighting. Here you can see where I'm starting to build out where the fiber optics will run. But this is the rest of the electronics. And it's a really, to me, this feels very messy and it kind of hurts my soul. I'm rethinking my electronic approach, electronics approach. And so look for that in hopefully a future video. The star of this nook is really fiber optics and a twinkling effect on this treasure pile. So the treasure pile is some scatter terrain. And I'm going to start by drilling a bunch of holes strategically placed and randomly drilled throughout this particular piece of, of terrain. The holes are just about the right size to accept the fiber optic. You want to try and get them as snug as possible, but we're going to fix all of this in with a little bit of glue so it can be a little bit, a little bit um, oversized. I'm leaving the fiber optics longer than they need to be and we will trim after everything is painted. So I don't need to worry about painting over the ends of the optics.
The lighting is provided by the strip of NeoPixels and I've created these little wells of, of light using strips of that balsa wood. I drilled a hole in the floor and then glued the treasure pile in its final location, running the fiber optics through the flooring, which will allow me to then bend those over and run those to the LEDs. The fiber optics are positioned using a couple strips of Gorilla Tape, double-sided Gorilla Tape, and this really holds it securely. The, the key here is to randomly distribute the fiber optics so that you get random twinkling and a random distribution of the lights through the fiber optics. The final step is really just to bring all of the rest of the terrain, the rest of the elements up to their final finished level of painting. This stuff does not need to be every pupil is painted perfectly. There's some serious alliteration going on there. It really is like the rest of the nook, the walls. It's It should be good use of color, lots of contrast, lights and darks, so that you're defining the shapes and the shadows, but it doesn't have to be obsessive, compulsive, painting at sort of a competition level. A lot of this stuff is never going to be seen. One of the things that I noticed late in the game was that it was dark in one area of the nook, right up front actually. And so I needed a way to easily insert some light. So I created this little lantern overlay or little thing that slots over a flicker LED and with a little bit of sanding on the LED to frost the glass and a little bit of paint and a split ring from a jewelry pile, I was able to create this cool lantern. For the exterior, I did want to give the box a little bit of something. And so I went to an online random dungeon map generator and created some random dungeons. I printed those out on a color copier, not a color inkjet printer. I was worried that the ink would bleed and then did a little decoupaging, collaging on the exterior box. I'm using PVA, but I could have used Mod Podge, which is exactly what Mod Podge is for. And I have kind of buckets of that stuff floating around, so I'm really not sure what the heck I was thinking when I started to drizzle this PVA on. However, it worked out fine. It buckled a little bit, but then it dried quite uh, nicely and flat unless you want to squish and wrinkle it but it all worked out pretty well and it was just a matter of doing some some collage work on it I didn't want the textures though to be too pronounced so I created this muddy gross wash which once I put it on I regretted the color that I had mixed I should have tested it but it was kind of too late and I'm usually at this point ready to just finish the project so I forged ahead and smeared it and slathered it on and then dabbed it back with a paper towel to really just drop that back I really do need to slow down at the end to make sure that I don't really do random terrible things to my projects right when I'm almost done it's a little bit of polycryl to seal everything up, but you could use a acrylic varnish of some sort just to make sure that you're protecting all of that paper. Once everything's sealed up, the last thing to do is connect the electronics. So I cut a hole in the back for a button. This is connected using a little, little plug that's wired in so I can take it out and disconnect the whole thing, swap batteries out, recharge the batteries. And then it needed a little bit of glazing. So this is just some inexpensive, easy to cut and score and snap glass replacement plastic that you can find at the hobby store. Once that's held in place, could use just a little bit of that, maybe that Gorilla Tape and some hot glue. The project is basically done. Everything just gets slid together, the power gets plugged in, and it is done, done, done.